your kid's life is dependent on the church you choose. Devil said cancer in both lungs. Well, these lungs sound good to me. Thank God. Many people have varying opinions as to what hypnosis actually does. And although some of the reactions to hypnosis and its side effects are not clearly understood, for many years doctors, psychics and occultists have used hypnosis to create a state of suggestibility in their subjects, whereby changes can be made to both their physiological and mental states. The most common response to hypnosis is in one's reaction to pain. As the awareness of pain greatly diminishes in a person who is in a suggestible state or one whose mind is refocused. And as you can see, even surgery is possible under these conditions. The subject is not, as many suppose, in some kind of mystical trance. Rather, their will has been given over to the hypnotist or counsellor, allowing him to implant ideas that are accepted and subsequently experienced as reality. The dangers that can arise from this are too frightening to contemplate. Aside from all this, what does the Bible say about the use of hypnosis and mind controlling techniques? Hypnosis and altered states of consciousness are, are very worrying phenomena, I believe. Um, we've wrapped it up, sanitized it, sci it scientists use these techniques or doctors use some of these techniques um, it worries me a great deal when Christians start to talk in terms of altered states of consciousness or use hypnosis in therapy um, the Old Testament Deuteronomy in particular warns against uh, seeking manifestations seeking um, interaction with the spirit world through a variety of techniques. It doesn't explicitly mention hypnosis, but what the New Testament warns us is that we must be self-controlled at all times. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit's ministry in our lives is self-control. And in Romans, Paul talks about the renewing of your mind. Use your minds. Think these things through. Understand them. And when Christians say it doesn't really matter what you believe or don't worry about the mind, it's the experience that matters. Feel it. I'm very worried because we must never disengage our minds. My, our minds are God-given. The scriptures are, are very clear that we are not to use the, 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 any kind of mind-altering techniques. Um, that's part of what is cursed. Deuteronomy, in my opinion, says that you are forbidden to use any kind of charming. And charming is what uh, hypnosis really is. I, I was a hypnotist before I became a believer. I taught medical hypnosis. I did stage hypnotism. 
and everything that is being done now in the name of God in terms of the mass meetings of signs and wonders could be duplicated by a hypnotist, by a good stage hypnotist. Even a bad stage hypnotist could duplicate it. These people, of course, will claim, I've never learned how to hypnotize anyone or anything like that. Indeed, I have spoken to ministers who have said that to me. Um, the truth is they have been taught without any question at all. Any of these conferences where the big events are happening, Catch the Fire, Arnott's conferences, all the rest of it, they have classes for ministers as to how to impart the blessing. If you actually look through their agenda and compare it to the process of stage hypnotism, it's exactly the same. The language is different, but uh, nonetheless, the actual things being um, imparted to the ministers as to what to do are identical. In the book, The Signs and Wonders Movement Exposed, pages 70 through 71, an 11-step help guide designed to assist the vineyard leaders minister the Holy Spirit is compared to the process of induction employed by stage hypnotists. The techniques are almost identical. Altered states of consciousness, I think, are very uh, much overstated. Um, people hypnotists particularly encourage the view that, that people are going into a mystical trance and they're no longer in control of themselves. I have a much more uh, low uh, key view of this. I think what primarily happens in hypnotism is that the person concerned allows his will to be taken over by someone else. He remains fully conscious and to that extent he's fully responsible for what he's done. <laughs> but he willed himself into a situation that I will do what the hypnotist says. And as such, he's very vulnerable. And of course, the hypnotist can say all sorts of crazy things to him and feed in all sorts of crazy ideas. But he's not in any profound trance. If you measure his uh, brain waves, they're not radically affected. He's not gone into a sleep pattern or anything like that. He might well be rela relaxed, um, but, but he's fully conscious and aware of what he's doing at all points in the process. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Ha <laughs> uh, Okay. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it is very easy to distinguish between the work of the Holy Spirit in physical healing and the so-called healings achieved by the faith healers. In fact, the results themselves are our guide as to which are produced by divine intervention and which are caused using hypnotic techniques. In Proverbs 17.22, it says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth up the bones. Following this line, the Charismatic Crusades major on entertainment, not exposition. The leaders know that manufacturing the right atmosphere is crucial to the process of pain relief, thereby creating the illusion that miracles are taking place. To understand the difference between faith healing and divine miracles, we must understand the difference between organic and functional disorders. Dr. Eric Chico, a medical doctor provides us with a simple explanation. A functional disease is one associated with a change in function of a bodily organ or tissue without any tissue damage. An organic disease is one associated with a demonstrable change in a bodily organ or tissue. One additional point we need to understand is that in all diseases, both functional and organic, there exists an emotional component. It is this emotional component that elicits a true physiologic response, such as seen in the placebo effect. This response, along with the fact that many symptoms are very much subjective, is responsible for patients experiencing decreased pain with a broken bone, decreased insulin requirements in diabetes, decreased frequency of chest pain or pressure episodes in coronary artery disease, etc. Also, in the highly festive and emotionally charged atmosphere of a faith healing service, the brain can be stimulated to release endorphins into the nervous system, 
which science says are pain suppressants 200 times more potent than morphine. This is why people can honestly say the pain is gone and sincerely believe they're healed until the effect wears off hours or days later. It's important to understand that the symptoms of an organic disease such as pain can be helped and relieved through some of the psychological principles that make faith healing work. However, the mere removal of the pain is far different from the actual healing of the disease causing the pain. About 25 years ago, when I was a medical student, I heard a, a lecture from a surgeon who was very concerned that he was seeing patients who were delaying coming to the doctor with their malignancies because they'd first of all gone to the healer and they had delayed for a fatal two or three months and then presented to him and he said there was nothing he could do that the cancer had already spread by the time he saw them. So far from healing people, uh, he saw these healers as actually killing people. And as a Christian, that worried me enormously. I thought, wow, if that's happening, then this is very serious, and we've got to monitor this carefully. And so I've, my ears have always pricked up since when stories of miraculous healing have been floated around to ask the next question, what's actually going on here? Has the person been healed? What do they, do they really have what they claim to have? So it's gone on since then. Well, the, the reason that these states of altered consciousness are dangerous is because, in my opinion, it opens you up to seducing and familiar spirits. The, 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 the wrecked lives that occur after individuals attend these meetings are never documented. We hear of them here because we have the National 800 number, the hotline, the victim's hotline, where people that have experienced this phenomena in the mass meetings it's it's there 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 there's a the endorphins are released into their system by their by their their own uh, hormonal system and they then long for that feel good feeling that came from that experience or that alleged anointing and and they end up in in, in terrible psychological conditions and that's what's so sad and many people then become totally turned off of god because they believe that somehow if they can't sustain that strong feeling, there, then there must be something wrong with them. And so they keep going back for more and more and more. When you look at today's charismatic uh, magazines, and it's in many of the mainline magazines, there's a different conference advertised every, almost every week where you go to get the anointing. Well, Jesus said, I mean, it's, 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 you don't need to go anywhere. The kingdom of God is within you if you just pick up the cross and abandon yourself to his love. You see that people enter into it in the first stage of hypnosis because they are going expecting a particular phenomena. That's the first stage of hypnosis. Then the use of music and the use of repetitive music and almost a chanting is a common occult technique to, to create suggestibility. And, and what you end up with is this phenomena that can be duplicated in any setting in anybody's name. We could do it in the name of Bruce, and it, wouldn't, it certainly isn't edifying to God. When we look at the ancient civilizations of the past, there's one thing that we see is very common. They're involved in various kinds of practices which alter their state of consciousness, whether it be through chanting or the use of music, or taking hallucinogenic drugs. They open the door to a spiritual dimension, an altered state of consciousness in which they perceive a spiritual dimension. And of course, from a biblical perspective, we need to be extremely careful because we know there is a spiritual dimension. Part of that dimension is holy. Another part of the dimension is unholy. And since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, the unholy spiritual realm has done everything they can to interfere in the affairs of mankind. And it's through these altered states of consciousness that that door can be opened to that fallen dimension. At the beginning of the program, we clearly define miracles as works which only God can do. Of course, the signs and wonders workers would state that it is God doing miracles through them. And few, if any, would directly claim that they themselves are performing the miracles. However, God is not manifesting miracles through them and anyone with the right training and props can produce the results they achieve. In this section of the program, we will show you how this is accomplished. 
when the stage magician puts a woman in a box and saws her in half. We all know that it is an illusion, but most of us are not in a position to open the box and see how the illusion is created. I think is the most important of all and this is the setting of the atmosphere and I'm telling you worship and praise sets an atmosphere for the gifts of the Spirit he knew how to give thanks in all his circumstances and what did he do he in him he set the atmosphere for the Spirit to speak to him you say I want the Spirit to move well honey set the atmosphere now you say I don't know this is really far out tonight isn't that wonderful you need to get far out. You need to, you say, well, we're walking on the water. No, we're not. We're walking on the word. Yeah. Sure. In my meetings, in the crusades that you've, yeah. you've, you've been yes. to, I'm, I'm, uh, music plays a big part in our meetings. Yes. But in other evangelist uh, services in the, in the past, and some even today, you know, music doesn't play a big part. Why? Is it because of me, or is it because of what God is doing? Another ingredient to revival is worship. We spend hours worshiping in these meetings. The more you worship, the more the glory of God comes down. Everyone who has been to a charismatic crusade knows that music dominates the proceedings. Few unfortunately realize why, for it is the music that is the source of the miraculous power, not the Holy Spirit. If the secular music world were to advertise their concerts as worship services instead of concerts, people would be insulted many would rightly ask the question, worshipping who? True biblical worship, of course, is devotion to God in all things. Charismatic worship is merely the worship of worship. To understand the effects of music more clearly, I spoke to two top professional musicians. Wurzel was lead guitarist with heavy metal group Motorhead, who were for 12 years chart toppers across the world. For many years, as one of the leading rock bands, Motorhead enjoyed a string of successes including world tours, music videos, and television appearances. Here they are in the music video for the occult horror film, Hellraiser. I also spoke to Rudy Dobson, a top session keyboard player, who has performed with some of the biggest bands and musical artists in the world, including The Bangles, Magnum, Billy Joel, The Truth, Foreigner, Paul Simon, Nick Kershaw and the Bee Gees. Now a believer himself, Rudy talked to me about the effects of music on an audience, and how through careful planning, musicians manipulate an audience by creating the right emotional atmosphere. We talked about his transition from secular artist to Christian and how the techniques of the world music scene are now influencing the church by passing off emotional experiences as the anointing of God. Well, being a session musician, you end up playing with loads of different types of bands like reggae bands, rock bands, pop bands, classical bands, jazz bands, you know, and as a session musician, as a keyboard player, you have to be able to cater for all types of every style of music, because if you can't do that, then you're going to get no work, because people want a particular feel, like for instance, a particular album I did a few years ago, uh, they wrote this particular type of track and they wanted to give it a jazz feel, therefore I couldn't play jazz, they normally had to get a jazz musician in, so therefore I wouldn't have got paid and they, another person would have. Uh, different types of music will give different types of emotions. For example, if you're in a stadium and you're playing a heavy rock track, 99.9.9% .9 .9 of the time, people will be jumping up and down and clapping their hands. If you're playing 
uh, a more serious track that's atmospheric and stuff, you'll probably find that they're waving their arms in the air very slowly and so on, according to what type of track it is. Um, you'll also go to things like if you go to a classical concert, people will not be waving their arms up and down in the air. They will just sit in there and listen to it in a different way. Right. Well, I went, I played for Motorhead for 12 years, professionally, and I went all over the world. We were around the world six times with the band, so I went everywhere, almost everywhere. And we played, uh, I played lead guitar. In fact, I made as much noise as I possibly could. But uh, I did very well at that. And before that, I played um, probably for about 10 years, um, semi-professionally, in pubs and clubs and small venues around the country. And struggled like everyone else. For example, when we played all over the world, we could play in Japan, uh, we could play in Germany, we would play in Czechoslovakia, we would play in uh, Brazil. Everybody in those countries all speak a different language and the uh, reaction that we got from that audience every time we played in all those countries was exactly the same, totally identical. They look the same, uh, they jump up and down the same way, they throw their arms up in the air the same way they do. No one can speak the same language in all of those countries, but they all recognize the, the music, they all have that, they have an atmosphere about it that um, induces, if you like, the, uh, that reaction from the audience. Um, whether there are lyrics or not, it could just be the musical form. It doesn't it matter whether you understand what's actually being sung. The, the style and the force that it comes across with, uh, that, that, that does it, that, uh, that communicates completely. You know, when I see a crowd at a Christian concert and a crowd at a non-Christian concert, the reaction is pretty much the same. They'll, they'll behave the same way. They'll stage dive the same way as they do at a uh, stage dive at a Christian concert the same as they would at a non-Christian concert. I believe they be behave exactly identical. I think the crucial thing about music is not whether it, the effect it has is natural or unnatural, natural, whether it's conscious or, or subconscious. Now I sit here doing my paperwork and I usually find music helps me through it. It relaxes me and I, I get very fed up with the amount of administration I've got to do. If I put on upbeat music, I tackle my work much more vigorously. I read faster, I think faster and I plough through it faster. I go home earlier. If I'm laid back and I'm listening to Chopin, um, by the end of the afternoon I've, I've only gone through half the tray. Now, I just haven't been aware of what's going on, but then I think, yes, well, that's probably the music I've been listening to has had that effect. So music clearly does affect us, the, the, way, the way we function, and um, just because we, it isn't a conscious thing, it doesn't mean to say it's a supernatural or business. I, th I think these are natural phenomena. It is, it is easy to get a crowd into an auto state of consciousness by the music you play and the particular types of music you play, um, i.e. that when I've played with secular bands, professional secular bands, we have been told to put music in certain orders in order to get the audience to do certain things at certain times of the concert. Like for instance, they have a very powerful track at the beginning to get people emotionally high so that they're geared up for the rest of the concert so that you can go through and bring the less powerful numbers through and then you bring them up to a high again. It's like a heartbeat where it's like a little pulse. It goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, and at the end it, it goes straight to the top from the particular style of music you do, i.e. the drums in the tracks dominate the way you are. If you have a soft drum part, then it's going to make people more relaxed, and if you have a heavy drum part, it's going to bring people up, and you'll find that they jump about, wave their arms in the air, you know, do the whole bit, and you'll find that the, the Christian Crusades, they're using particular songs in those crusades and you find they're always the same type of particular songs um, to get the people to do certain things and the certain words that are used in those songs also are auto suggestions to what is going to come later on in that crusade are you um, come holy spirit come uh, is a particular track they use a lot in these crusades and it's all focusing on the holy spirit so people are expecting something to happen before it actually happens it's already put in their mind in the, in the back of their mind subconsciously. So when they actually say the Holy Spirit has come and you're going to fall down and so on, people expect that's going to happen to them so they actually do what they think is going to happen. Well, music is, is integral to causing people to go into an altered state of consciousness. Normally the music is repetitive, it has a strong beat, uh, 
Um, it is normally very simple in terms of its lyrics and construction because that kind of repetitive music, and I believe, by the way, that the music that's, mo that's most effective, the beat and the harmonic is a function of a natural body function, of your heartbeat or your respiration rate. And it brings you into that state of, of suggestibility. As I said, when people attend one of these meetings, they're already in the first state of hypnosis. Then the music enhances it, the lighting enhances it, the, the common um, purpose of all of the huge crowds enhance it further. And soon the people will do anything, and we've seen them do anything in the meetings. And when you go into a, um, a big Christian rally, a big Christian meeting, 15, 10, 15,000 people there, that are going absolutely berserk. At the, at the very start, as soon as the guy walks on the stage, they go ape. And uh, it's exactly the same in a rock concert. It's, uh, and it really is absolutely identical. The lights go off, and we've got, uh, the lights go down, the crowd goes crazy. Because um, they're in anticipation of what's going to happen. And then. Uh, we, we didn't, but most bands then put on an introduction tape and uh, it's all dark and you just see the little, you know, it's a big build up and atmosphere, big atmosphere and then whoa, off it starts, under the lights and everybody goes berserk. And it's very much like that and not quite as dynamic perhaps at a, at a Christian rally, but um, it's very much in the same pattern, well, almost identical, almost identical pattern. We use music to accompany all sorts of things. It accompanies us, well, we have our little meal in the restaurant, now we've got this sweet music playing in the restaurant, you know, in the background music. And it's all nonsense. You're not really listening to the music, but it's just induced. It makes you have a nice evening. You, you're not really aware of it. In fact, it's, it's quite an unconscious thing. And it's, it's quite clever the way supermarkets dish out this ambient music, if you like, just to make you, I don't know, I don't know what it makes you think of. It doesn't make me think, oh, I'd better buy some margarine. It doesn't make me think things like that. But it, uh, it does put you in a, a relaxed state of mind, which is probably good to shop. I don't, I, I don't actually know, but um, I know that it is played for that reason. It's played in supermarkets to take your mind off something or other and to just let you get on and shop. Um, you can control an audience to exactly how you want, and a particular example of that is that um, when I played with the Beatles, there's a particular track called Words. Every country we went to, every gig we did in those countries, they all waved their arms in the air and they all cried on that particular song. And they all were waving candles and yet people did not know what other people were doing in different countries, yet they were all doing the same thing. It should come as no surprise that Satan's deceptions should be perpetrated using music for he is described in scripture as the anointed cherub, the one whose pipes and tarbrets were created in him. Surely, if there is any arena in which Satan could adequately function, it would be within the area of music. We should therefore exercise caution where music and ministry cross paths. As with all things, scripture is our guide for faith, doctrine and conduct. Nowhere in scripture did Jesus and the apostles use music at a healing rally. In fact, music in the New Testament is hardly mentioned at all. The truth is, without the music and the hype at Charismatic Crusades, little, if anything, would happen. It's very hard to imagine what would happen if we, if we took out all worship, all music, all singing, all instruments. Um, but if we could uh, envisage such uh, phenomena within the Charismatic Church, I, I don't know what would be left because it's such an essential ingredient to generate a mood and atmosphere of expectation which is so often associated with times of ministry and, and the manifestations. If you remove the, the vehicle through which these uh, phenomena are generated, uh, I suspect there will be much less in the way of manifestation. I think it's very interesting today in churches that the prime way in which people think people can be brought to church is by putting on a good show. Make the music good. Make the, the church building beautiful. Make the car park accessible. Make it clear that we're such nice guys. They'll be warmly welcomed at the door. Everything is put on to make people feel comfortable. And then the gospel is presented that God loves you. And all these lovely people do love you too. And all the wonderful things that can come from this. Now that 
bears no resemblance whatsoever to how the New Testament went about proclaiming the gospel. Paul didn't have a load of roadies that went with him, setting up the music band and setting up cameras and doing all the kinds of things which are absolute standard issue now at any of the big church services. He didn't need PA systems, but what he did do was to preach the gospel of repentance. Read the book of Acts again. Nowhere was music ever used, to my knowledge, at a gospel event. They didn't sing beforehand, and yet that seems to be almost essential. Jesus certainly, to my knowledge, never used a music band at any point. They did sing the Psalms, they did sing some hymns when it was appropriate according to the Jewish liturgy. But no, Peter wasn't on bass guitar, we didn't have Judas playing drums, we didn't, none of it. It's so, so different. And who are we kidding? If we think we're nice guys and people will become Christians because we're nice guys, I can tell you they're going to be building their life on sand. I'm not a nice guy. Neither is the next man in the pew to me. We're all rotten sinners, saved by grace. Unless God is drawing them by his Holy Spirit, and that will not happen unless the word is clearly proclaimed, we're wasting our time. We're just making clubs of nice people getting together. No gospel. <laughs> world-renowned illusionist and investigator of those with alleged supernatural abilities, Andre Cole, states in his book, Mind Games, page 242, the following. Many people are being misled by dynamic personalities who claim to have a gift from the Lord. These preachers may have a gift, but it definitely is not the gift of healing. They simply have learned, accidentally or intentionally, some good psychological principles and some theatrics. We need to remember that fact when we next attend a healing service. If God has healed you, rejoice and thank Him. Give Him glory for His miraculous power. Don't attribute supernatural powers to someone using merely natural ability. About 65 years ago, the Holy Spirit came into our Catholic home and baptized my mother in the Holy Ghost when she never heard there was any such an experience. She was baptized. She was baptized in the Holy Spirit praying Catholic prayers while she was in bed. And my father said, what's wrong? And she said, I don't know. She said, I, I just feel like I have to pray. And he says, well, pray. And she went through the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Apostle Creed. And then she started all over again with the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Apostle Creed. And she woke my father up again. And he said, what's wrong? She said, I don't know. I just have to pray. And he said, well, pray. And for the third time, he woke up. This time, the bed was shaking. And he says, what's wrong? And she says, I don't know. She said, I just have to pray. And he said, hey, somebody's in this room. He said, we better get out of bed and get on our knees. And so they got on their bed, and my mother began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave her utterance. Praise God. We are not interested. <laughs> whether this is the actual blood of Jesus or whether this is black currant juice. Just, just talk a little bit about doctrine because man can be so silly, uh, not doctrine, tradition. Man can be so silly. Oh, well, this is, do you believe this is actually the blood of Jesus? That is irrelevant. It is irrelevant whether this is actually the blood of Jesus or whether this is just black currant juice. I just want to make this point. Sure. What's relevant is that 2,000 years ago, Jesus was nailed to a cross. He was pierced in his side and blood came forth. Every drop of blood in his body drained out. The charismatic movement has always been the bridge to Rome. They speak in tongues, so do we, therefore we're one in the spirit. Now the first, the charismatic movement in the United States, Catholic charismatic movement, began at Duquesne University. It moved to Notre Dame. And I can tell you that one of the first utterances in tongues in Notre Dame was something like this. Um, that which Our Lady of Fatima has said shall surely come to pass. 
Our Lady Fatima is a demon, and I could document that. What Our Lady Fatima said is, is wrong, it's evil. But we have big charismatic, big um, ecumenical gatherings of charismatics, <clears throat> where you have Catholics and so-called evangelicals and, and whatever, all intermingled, and they'll overlook anything because we all speak in tongues. So unfortunately, it has been a, a major a bridge to Rome. I'm sure the Lying Signs and Wonders movement, as we refer to it today, is a pathway to ecumenism, to bringing all churches and groups and denominations together, irrespective of whether they hold to true biblical doctrine or not. I don't think it's intentionally that, but I think that's the outcome, for the simple reason that where there are signs and wonders, it is assumed that we have the presence of the work of the Spirit of God. And if we have the presence of the work of the Spirit of God, that's all that matters, never mind our fundamental theological position. And that is a quite contrary scripture position. It begins, for most people, with a shared experience, which is then given a superficial shared theological framework. And here, as it were, the Roman Catholics and the Evangelicals and, and Charismatics are, as it were, building on a, a foundation of sand because the experience is where it begins and the interpretation is where it gets shared. Interestingly, the phenomena, the signs and wonders and the peculiar um, way in which people behave is paralleled between, say, Medjugorje and these places there and Toronto and the charismatic ones. The same kind of bizarre phenomena are going on and of course people think, well it's the same thing. It's another manifestation of God. And so the idea comes across that uh, the shrines where Mary is manifesting is just another way in which God is moving his church together. This great theme of unity which is the wonderful thing which covers over all the wrong teaching which is being ignored and put to one side. Shared common experience a shared muddled theological understanding of that experience leading to a so-called doctrinal and theological unity. More and more it's come, the emphasis is on the experience and on the phenomena, both the uh, weeping statues and the, for that matter, the bleeding or not the weeping hands, the oil on the hands, all these things that have been talked about, most of which are illusory, um, are shared grounds for saying it must be the same God at work. Well, I actually probably think it is, but it's not the God we know as revealed in Scripture. Without a doubt, the signs and wonders movement is a deception of the enemy. Because of it, doctrine is discarded, and experience without truth is embraced. The end product is a counterfeit Christianity, filling churches with false converts. Many of the charismatic leaders have already taught that people can be saved without the preaching of the gospel. Colin Dye in England and Rodney Howard Brown in America are only two among many who have said this publicly. Through the charismatic movement, the bridge to Rome is complete and the work of the Reformation is turned on its head. Through the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church removed the word of God so men could not be saved. Once again, the word of God is shadowed, this time by experiences that replace the Word of God as our assurance of salvation. The charismatic leaders of today are every bit as morally bankrupt as the priests of the Middle Ages. Lies and half-truths are unfortunately their stock and trade. The contributors to this program have tried again and again to communicate to many of the leaders criticized in this video in the hope that they would repent and turn away from these things. In England, I have spoken to leading charismatic figure Colin Dye several times about the many deceptions being perpetrated upon believers in the UK by the likes of Maurice Sorello, Benny Hinn and Rodney Howard Brown. Even after being shown clips of Benny Hinn lying blatantly, he still promotes his ministry. Clips like these. Are there places right now where you can sense it more than in other places? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Africa's one. Mm -hmm. I was in Ghana recently preaching one night, they brought a man. And this man was put uh, uh, on the platform, and he was dead. The man was dead. And uh, uh, it was a very scary thing because nobody told me he was dead. So you didn't know he was dead? I did not know he was dead. Oh, my, oh, my. So what happened? What happened is while I was ministering, you know, I was praying for the, for the sick. Yeah. 
And uh, I was looking back and forth saying, what's happening, what's happening? And they were telling me, well, she was healed of this, she was healed of that. Well, the reason I did not know he was dead, because I thought maybe he had fainted. Mm -hmm. Now, I saw his body being picked up, you know, from hand to hand, and they put him on the stage. Mm -hmm. but, but the people knew he was dead because of what he was wearing. Oh, and you had no idea? No, I, I mean, no, nobody told me that the dead were what they, they had on him. No, no. And I remember him wearing like a very pale-looking garment, you know, very yeah. gray, pale-looking thing. Mm -hmm. and, and he was, they put him down, I thought maybe he had fainted. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the crowd became very restless. And I was praying, I remember praying with the lady with arthritis, and I was asking her to move her arms up and down, and suddenly the place went, the people went, went, went wild almost out of control and I thought well it's only arthritis you know because after <laughs> it was the ladies healing they got them all yeah, going yeah, yeah. but what I did not know is behind my back the man was getting up and moving oh my oh my yeah, I was in Ghana just recently we had half a million people show up and a man was r raised from the dead on the platform that's a fact people do you literally believe that someone has been resurrected on the program oh John I would not limit God uh, God can raise the dead, absolutely. I have not seen it. In that one case, we did hear about it. They brought a man, and this man was put uh, uh, on the platform, and he was dead. The man was dead. I have not seen it. In that one case, we did hear about it. Their way, and she fought with that. She tried to call them. For them to, for questions, the, the uh, staff at Benny Hinn. Do you know the case of Joyce Vaughan, the Houston woman? I, I'm, I'm sorry, no, tell me about her. As you can see, Benny Hinn lied about this so-called miracle, and also of having any knowledge of Joyce Vaughan's death. In reality, he spent over two hours discussing that same fatality with Ole Anthony some years before. Sadly, these are not isolated incidents as Benny Hinn has fabricated many stories in his books about healings and about family details relating to his childhood. The question everyone should be asking is when does he stop? As you have seen, he is very calm when he does it. Colin Dye seems to be following a similar path. He freely admitted to me that Maurice Sorello's mail shots were not written by Sorello, even though every letter is written in the first person. And Colin Dye himself deceptively and consciously fools his followers in promoting a book in his name that he did not even write, apart from some small sections which contain transcripts from his sermons. The rest is ghost written, clearly not by the Holy Ghost, who is a spirit of truth. The motive, I can only assume, is money. With the numerous signs and wonders leaders I have seen investigated, money is normally the real mission. So we decided to look at the various mail shots sent out by charismatic leaders to see the real message that they contain. Take Benny Hinn for example. By looking at his partner letters, you can begin to see what is the thrust of his teaching. In a given period, we looked at all the partner letters mailed and counted the number of times relevant Christian themes or words were used, like the name of Jesus for example. The results were quite shocking. Over several months, the name of Jesus was used 10 times, repentance once, healing 15 times, and so on. When it came to words like harvest, sow, or seed, they were used 39 times. Or finances, debt, or material need, these were mentioned 36 times. Of course, no one would disagree with ministries raising money for legitimate needs, so we asked a searching unbeliever to write to some of the well-known charismatic ministries and inquire how to become a Christian. Roberts Lairdon, no reply. John Avanzini Ministries, no reply. John Bevere Ministries, no reply. Creflo Dollar Ministries, no reply. And then there are the ones that did respond, like Marilyn Hickey and Jesse Duplantis Ministries. Only Jesse Duplantis Ministries sent a free video entitled, Why I Should Be Saved. And that was devoid of any real gospel message at all. But what is worse is what came with it, and continued to come for months afterwards. Product catalogues, covenant partner forms, and appeals for money. Marilyn Hickey Ministries didn't even send the free video, just the appeals for funds. 
In fact, only one ministry that we wrote to, a UK ministry, took any time to present the gospel or to recommend a local church. Their priorities are clear. They are businesses, not gospel missions, who care about lost souls. And, uh, do you know, Rory, recently there, there was a series of criticisms coming through in various ministries. And um, I was praying about it and asking the Lord, why is this happening? And what did he want us to do about it? Well, there's one thing. It's not very complimentary, but, but Jesus said, here's how you handle a Pharisee. He says, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Don't waste time arguing and debating in fruitless ways. That's the first thing. Yes, carry on, please. And then something else. You know, this kind of persecution is necessary. Now, I'm not excusing it. I'm not excusing, I'm not saying it's right, but in many ways it's necessary because it authenticates the anointing. Judging one another is a luxury that you cannot afford. Let me say that again. Judging one another is a luxury that you cannot afford. Why not? Because Satan will see to it that you get what's coming to you. By now, you're probably wondering, what do I do next? Before I close, let's hear some last words from our speakers. God, I don't limit God. Uh, I'm not limiting God at all. But I can discern what men are doing in his name that is not of God. Now, some of them will threaten you. Benny Hinn has done it on TBN. Paul Crouch has threatened. Uh, I watched it live once. When he said, you heretic hunters, you can go to hell. If God doesn't shoot you first, I will. We are told to judge. Let the first speak, you know, and let the others judge. Uh, the Bible talks about false doctrine. How am I going to know that it's false doctrine? In the last, it talks about apostasy. Uh, I, I must be able to judge. I must be able to decide what is of God and what is not of God. Now they will use this uh, specious argument, uh, a misquote from the Old Testament, touch not the Lord's anointed. Well, where does that come from? David, Saul was, was in his hands. He, they were hiding in the cave of Adullam. Um, no, it wasn't the cave of Adullam. They were, David and his men were hiding in a cave as they were being pursued by Saul. Saul comes in and takes a nap. And David's men say, you got him, kill him. David said, I will not lift up my hand upon the Lord's anointing. On another occasion, a deep sleep from the Lord came upon Saul and his men and David, and uh, one of his nephews went in among the host, and he said, I'll kill him. And David said, I will not lift up my hand upon the Lord's anointing. I won't touch the Lord's anointing. But on that occasion, they took his spear and they took his canteen when they got a safe distance away across a ravine and up on a, you know, a, a cliff overlooking it. David yells down. He rebukes Saul for what he's doing. He will not touch, to not touch the Lord's anointing means you don't kill him, you don't harm him. But it doesn't mean you don't question what someone is teaching. The, the Bereans were commended for questioning what Paul taught. They searched the scriptures to see whether what Paul taught was right. And the whole idea is that if what he taught was not according to the Bible, uh, they, they, would, um, they would disagree with him on, on that basis. So you are the, the very anointed that David would not harm, would not touch, meaning to harm him. He rebuked him publicly before Saul's men and before David's men. The, the book of Revelation says that, you know, they, they say they are of the church but are not. I mean, there are a million examples where, where you're not safe just because Jesus' name is preached. You've got to test what's being said by the word. You've got to test what's being said by the component of eternity. The word for truth, every other language besides one, can only define truth by what it isn't except Hebrew. Hebrew defines truth by truth is that which is eternal. There, if any, and that's what all of us are. All men are truth seekers. Normally, and, and, and at your teenage years is when you're the biggest truth seeker. So that's, that's what everybody objects to. We encourage it. We try to make people 
test and challenged it. So they find out that which is eternal. They're convinced that what they believe in is true. And so it's very difficult to come before these people and say what you believe is wrong. Even though you present biblical reasons that what they believe is not biblically based, they say, well, not everything that God does is in the Bible. You can't put God in a box. One man said that if everything that happened on the day of Pentecost was written in the book of Acts, you would need a wheelbarrow to carry the book of Acts around. But that's building a theology based on what the Bible does not say. We are to build our theology, our doctrines, on what the Bible does say. And that's why people get off into these deceptions, is because they base their theology on experiences, but not on the Word of God. I think the, the crucial issue is what is the nature of our mandate? Is our mandate to preach the gospel or to preach and to heal? If our mandate from the gospels is to preach the gospel, and we then add something onto that, whether it is church attendance, the sacraments, uh, any ritual of any sort, or, 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 or healing, then we are clearly adding to the gospel that we were given, and therefore it is another gospel. Uh, and whereas the Reformation had to wrestle with works being added on, and whether you're saved just by faith and trusting in Christ, so today uh, you've got, it's faith plus healing. The consequence of going into an altered state of consciousness and having suggestions made to you and you becoming hypnotized is that you do have a mind-changing experience. The common word for this is a paradigm shift. Go to the drug culture of the 60s and you will find that's exactly what they were talking about, mind-bending drugs. Now, some of them discovered that you can have mind-bending experiences under uh, meditation, TM, all these kinds of things, bent people's minds permanently in some instances. And that's what we're seeing happening. People's minds are being bent uh, by the effect of their experience. So the experience rules, the suggestions made while they were under that experience are the rules that, that guide them. Scripture is now simply a lip service statement. Oh yes, well we can find a verse about it somewhere, usually totally out of context. That's what's happening to people. That is why, unless they repent of the experience, they are not going to be able to hear the Word of God. And there is the catch-22 for so many. Um, they cling to the experience as proof to them that God has his favor on them, instead of clinging to Scripture, where we have the eternal promises of God, uh, which cannot be changed. If I had one thing to say to the charismatic world, and, and I had the opportunity to say it, I think it would be to say, focus on Jesus, not manifestations of the Spirit. Focus on Jesus Christ and salvation through him, and read your Bibles and use your brains and question everything else. Perhaps the only solution to the, the apostasy, if that's what it is, the gullibility certainly of so many Christians today, is that those who stand apart from so much that is represented by modern charismata, and there are good Pentecostal people who would stand apart from a lot of the, the, the peripheral things today, the only solution is first for Christians to be living such quality lives that the attractiveness of their lives will make people realize there's something better than the hype I've been led to believe is all important. And the second thing is that those in positions of teaching and preaching must maintain a clear biblical standard, testing everything by scripture, but with a life and a vitality that is in itself attractive. The church in the 60s uh, betrayed itself by allowing hordes of people to go into the charismatic movement because frankly they themselves were so dull and boring and we have to show that there is a better alternative because there is a better alternative to hype and pretend. Our desire in making this video is to reach the many sincere people who are being lied to and deceived by the kind of ministries we have highlighted in this program. Jesus said there will be many people who will cry, Lord, Lord, on the day of judgment, and that these will be people who genuinely believe that they were saved. We do not want anybody watching this program to be one of those. Many people who were formerly charismatics later discovered that they were not born again after examining their teachings and experiences by the Word of God. 
we are exhorted in Scripture to see whether we really are in the faith. To have this assurance, we must have come to Christ by the biblical root of repentance and faith, which can only come by the preaching and teaching of his word, correctly interpreted and faithfully taught. Out of the many people who will see this video, there will be some who will begin to walk with God in a new way. Not by sight, looking for signs and experiences, but by faith in the word of God that is sure. The first thing you must now do is get away from anything to do with these deceptions and study the word of God for yourself. Then pray and ask God in his time to put you in contact with sound Christian friends where you can truly grow into the image of Christ and experience genuine Christian fellowship. If you have any concerns, please feel free to contact one of the speakers in this program who will be more than happy to help you find the right road. And once again, thank you for watching. Too many Christians have died believing the errors of the Signs and Wonders movement. These are some of them. Joyce Vaughan. Natalia Barnett. Yvonne Reynolds. Laura Twilley. Alina Riley.